Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preached, let it be accursed. As I have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you've received, let him be accursed. You know, going shopping right now with so much uh, shut down, so many changes because of COVID-19, uh, it's a different experience uh, having to stand in line outside the stores with a certain distance and then only certain numbers of people being allowed in. And I don't know if you ha have experienced this, but there have been many times here in the last few weeks when I have gone into uh, down one aisle and I've been trying to find one product and it's not there. So I got to say, well, what else is there that I can get and, 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 and buy instead to make sure that the needs of feeding our family are taken care of? And you're walking through the store and you're having to make these decisions. What should I get? What should I, what should I take? What should I put in my cart? Or I know some people call it a buggy either way. Uh, and then once you've, you've picked everything, you go to the checkout lane and you have to stay there and, and go through slowly and you go in, you put all your items on the conveyor, and you pay and then you take those items home. And you know, recently I've been thinking that uh, going shopping, because you have to be so intentional about it now, because it's so different, it kind of makes me think a little bit about our own spiritual walk and also the history of of this planet. In many respects, we now are in the checkout lane of history. And the question should come to our minds, have we made the right choices in what we have purchased? Have we put the right items into that cart or that buggy in our lives so that as we move toward checkout, we know we have what we need inside? I'd like to go through a few verses with you in the Bible to talk about this concept. Uh, the first is we're going to turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. And uh, there are two very short parables here that Jesus told. And I love the fact that Jesus used parables. He told stories. Uh, it kind of makes us understand a little bit more what he is trying to get across. 
And in verse 44 of Matthew 13, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy he went, and he sold all that he had, and he bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he had found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he bought it. You know, there have been some times I've been shopping here in the last few weeks, and, and I'll get into an aisle, and, and there's something that, I, that my wife has said, hey, we need this for food for, for the rest of this week or for next week, and there's one left. And it kind of feels like I've found that treasure, that one thing that is of great value, and it goes and we purchase it uh, for feeding our family. When we read in Matthew 6, verse 33, it says, Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. We need to make sure in our lives that we are seeking first what is the most valuable, what is the most important, what has eternal value more than just what has value here on earth. Again, in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 9, is this parable that Jesus tells about the, the kingdom of heaven and what is going to take place just before Jesus comes back. And starting in verse number 1 of Matthew 25, it says, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And at midnight the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for us and you. And listen to what their counsel was. Instead, go to those who sell and buy some for yourselves. Now the implication here is that the wise ones, they had already gone and bought that oil. They had already purchased what was needed. So I guess that we can think about as we are, are in the, the checkout line of history in our own lives, we want to make sure that first we have the, the seeking of the kingdom of God inside, but we also have to make sure that we have plenty of oil, the oil of the Holy Spirit. We've got to have that in our shopping cart, in our buggy too, before we check out. Then we also read in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 18 to the angel of the church in Laodicea, the final church, the, the checkout lane church, if you will. These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. I do not need a thing. But you do not realize you are wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. Basically what Jesus is saying in this passage is, you think that your shopping cart is filled with all the stuff that you need. You've crammed all this stuff in there and you really don't need that. What does he say instead? He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold, Refined in the fire. So put some of that in there. So you can become rich. And white clothes, symbolizing, of course, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Now the whole concept of being able to see correctly is the fact that so often we look at the world through, through our own lenses. Through our vision. Sometimes we look at others and we look at them and say, hey, they're not of as much value as other people. They don't matter. They are left by God. They are cursed. You know, there, there's many things that this verse can, all, can imply, but the idea here is that you're not seeing things the way you need to see them. 
You need his eye salve in your cart so that you can see properly the way he wants you to see. So you get there to the checkout lane, and you one by one, you put the items on the conveyor, and it runs down, and then you get ready to pay. But then, as you're there waiting, as you're going down that aisle, something catches your attention out of the corner of your eye. It's colorful. It's bold. It's bright. And, and you see some of these. <laughs> yeah, these are tabloids that are there. Um, you know, often when I, when I go down the, in the checkout lanes, I see these and I, I find myself thinking, I'm so glad that I'm not famous because stuff like this could be printed about me. Um, you'll see here there's a shocking wedding surprise and, and this Hollywood dream explodes and there's anger and there's tears and, and, and William Hawk mocks Harry, I told you so. And, and you see all these headlines that go in here and you look through it and it is... Uh, it's just a bunch of ridiculousness uh, for the most part. Um, here's another one that, that was there. Um, uh, very interesting, if you didn't know. Now here it says, Lucille and, uh, Lucy and Ethel. Oh yes, shocking truth about their love. Now if you read it, it's garbage in there. because It says that, that, that really in reality that they had love for each other, the, you know, that kind of love, if you will. They were lesbians. And that has been debunked over and over and over. It's not true, but yet it's all in here and it just catches your attention. Now, I will say, you get in here in the middle of it and guess what? There is this little this article in here, Your Best Life Ever, Five Bible Prayers That Heal. So they even put Bible scriptures in here. And they tell you in here in an article to eat plenty of nuts to help with Alzheimer's. There is some truth in that. Now, when you read some of this, and I, I hope that you do not read this. The only reason I bought these is as a sermon illustration for this. But when you read through them, you'll realize that, that they aren't giving truth. And you have to ask yourself sometimes, why do those even exist? They mostly don't even quote actual people. Now, they'll say something like, Someone close to them said, or it has been rumored that, or sources say, but you never have any credibility in it. It's all rumor, it's conjecture, it's supposition. Now, like I said, there is some truth in that. There is an article in there about the, you know, from the Bible with a lot of scriptures, but I would never encourage somebody to get one of those as a source of Bible truth. I also, there's an article in there, like I said, about health, but I wouldn't encourage somebody to pick up one of those to learn how to be healthy. Just because there is a little tiny bit of good doesn't mean it is worth your time. Yet, obviously, they sell enough copies of those magazines to keep printing them. It might be for the sheer entertainment of laughing at all the ridiculous claims that are made inside. Or it might be that perhaps it might be revealing some hidden truths that the normal media doesn't want you to know. <laughs> you know, there is a similar mindset as that in areas of spirituality. It's called Gnosticism. I don't know if you've ever heard of that term. According to a writer named David Reed, he says the Gnostics believed that the material world was evil and that the esoteric knowledge or the spiritual knowledge was the way of salvation from this evil world. Knowledge of facts hidden to most others was to the Gnostic the path to liberation. You know, Gnosticism as a belief system uh, began the first century Christianity, so not very long after Jesus was here on earth. And it taught that the truths evident in Scripture were only the surface of true understanding. That to really be enlightened, it required discovering of the hidden truths, the secret meanings, the amazing discoveries behind reality, and that peace and wisdom only existed to those who could decipher the symbols and know what was really going on. They actually called it the the myth. Now, that's not as in false. We usually think now of a myth being false. But being myth is mythical, behind the scenes, hidden, magical, supernatural. 
And they taught that the things that we see here, this is not really reality, that there's, there's a deeper reality. And if you really want understanding, if you really want to understand the things of God, then you have to search out those hidden things, those secret things that most everybody can't understand. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica website, Britannica.com, when it's talking about this, it says, life in this imperfect world that does not contain inklings of truth, or does contain, rather, inklings of truth. Human wisdom does have a relation to divine reality, yet wisdom can go astray and false gods can result. Humanity in a state of spiritual amnesia before accepting the revelation of the myth is awakened by reconnection with perfect knowledge. That is uh, from the Encyclopedia Britannica talking about this idea of Gnosticism. So how does that relate to us spiritually here in the, the checkout lane of time? Well, I would say the modern equivalent of Gnosticism, also called Neo-Gnosticism, is Christian conspiracy theories. There might, might not be Christian, but in our realm it would be Christian conspiracy theories. Christian conspiracy theories are all about revealing the hidden secrets, showing the secret signs and the symbols, because they, they seem to proclaim, if you don't understand them, then you will be deceived and you will likely be lost. I remember years ago when barcodes first began appearing on products in stores, and, and there were claims they were part of some sinister, diabolical plot. I also remember, you probably do too, uh, years ago when there was a, a symbol on the back of Procter & Gamble products and somebody had taken that and they had drawn lines from the different stars and the moon and somehow that equaled up to 666 and they said, no, don't buy anything Procter & Gamble because they have the mark of the beast on them. Um, more recently, I, I saw a video of, of somebody, uh, if you've ever seen Monster Energy Drinks, that M, the way it is, looks like claws, of course, supposed to be from a monster. But if you take it and turn it upside down, you can actually create sixes in there. And, and there are some Christians, unfortunately, that claim that monster energy drinks are part of the mark of the beast. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 I laugh because I think it's just so sad of the deception that is out there. Not the deception of those hidden symbols, but the deception of those who think that that really is what it's talking about. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 through 17, it says the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. So they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Often when you hear Christian conspiracy theorists talking, somehow it goes back to these verses. Somehow it relates to the mark of the beast and, and the restrictions in our freedoms and, and that we can't buy or sell. That is a common theme in almost all of them. It is this fear of the mark of the beast that is the energy that drives modern Christian conspiracy theories or neo-Gnosticism in the church. And yet the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. We have to ask, where is our focus? Is our focus on the potential dangers or is our focus instead on the one who says, I give my peace to you, peace that surpasses all understanding? You know, as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, I want to say that as a church, we follow the historicist interpretation of prophecy. Now, we're not going to go into all the different ways to interpret prophecy, but as a church, we follow the historicist method of biblical prophetic interpretation. By the way, it's the same method that was used by the, that led to the Protestant Reformation. Through that method, Martin Luther and all of the other Protestant reformers they, uh, they learned, they concluded that the little horns of Daniel chapters 7 and 8, the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and the leopard-like or sea beast of Revelation chapter 13, they were all pointing to the same 
union of church and state when the political power of Rome was invested into the church of Rome, known as the papal Roman power. That, th- this is the study. This is the understanding of all the Protestant reformers and the Seventh-day Adventists. We still say this is the most accurate biblical interpretation. Through earnest Bible study, these four identifiers I'm about ready to tell you were determined to prove the identity of the Antichrist system, regardless of who is in charge of it over time. The Antichrist system biblically is one that would deny the eternal authority of the Ten Commandment law as an unchanging expression of the nature and the will of God. It would also teach that the gospel of justification by grace through faith alone, not by works of the law, is inadequate. This antichrist system would teach that you had to do other things, that maybe you would gain justification by a certain behavior or a certain act or a certain sacrifice, and that is how you, re- re- how you got the grace of God instead of what the Bible says it's a free gift. The Antichrist system also, this this power, would downplay the centrality of Jesus Christ, actually denying the centrality of Jesus Christ as our only mediator between ourselves and God. That, That power instead would teach, would say that we must go to another person that would be our mediator between us and the Father, or we would pray to saints or to Mary in order to approach God. And yet the Bible says, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And he says that we may boldly approach the throne of grace ourselves. And yet this antichrist system that we see in the Bible teaches something that is contrary to that. And and finally, when such a power denies these three previously listed truths I just shared, it will ultimately seek to gain obedience by either false miracles or through force. And normally, those would go together, employing both strategies. Now, biblically, that is what we understand prophetically. However, in in Revelation 13, verse 3, it says, one of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. In some translations, it says wondered after the beast. Now, here is where I would say that we Protestant historicist Christians and Seventh-day Adventists, we can run into some danger. The danger is this, that sometimes some, uh, some ways that we behave can be like tabloid Christianity. It can all be be about the splash headlines and the shocking news and, and, oh my goodness, what is going on? Uh, and, And sometimes that is a danger for us as Christians. I have a question for you. If you are a Bible believing Christian uh, and and if you uh, understand that there are some religious systems that may be false. If you were going through the checkout lane and you saw a magazine there that had headlines instead about different religions that you think are full of error, would you be more apt to pick that up and look at it than you would about entertainment? That would answer whether you are led to those things more than maybe you should. Some ministries I know of Sadly, a large portion of their their marketing and fundraising materials are actually, or or, or even their actual presentations are all about the beasts of Revelation 13. Or they always go back to that in some form. But often these are are conflagrated with half-truths, with suppositions, with hearsay with innuendo and assumptions, all things that are hallmarks of conspiracy theories. Many are factually incorrect as well. Others are are just, sad to say, they're just ridiculous. I saw a presentation recently by somebody who who, uh, I guess had had been doing a a search online for the term COVID-19 or actually coronavirus. And they found a reference of coronavirus in a very obscure comic book that probably not more than 20 or 30,000 people in the world have ever read. 
It came out a few years ago, and in this comic book, which was set in the ancient Roman world, the champion uh, person for Rome was named Coronavirus, and the speaker tried to say that somehow this comic book was showing, was revealing some hidden sinister idea that I guess that Rome was behind the virus that we are dealing with now. You know, I have to shake my head because to me, the, out, the people that, that don't ascribe to this, that, that may be saying, hey, what can Christianity offer me? What, is, what does the Bible offer me? They may see that and say, this is ridiculous. This should not be what we should be about as Christians, about those who say we are waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. And often when you look at some of the graphics that are used in many of the video presentations, they look very much like the front cover of a tabloid magazine. That should not be what we should be about as people. You know, I, I, in the last few months, I've been reading a number of articles on the dangers of conspiracy theories in the church. One of the comments to one of them really struck me, and, I, and I'm going to have this up on the screen, and I'm sharing it without the person's name, um, but I am going to do something, and I'm going to put the link on there as well, because I don't want it to be that you just see, see me put something up there and say, oh, that must be true. I want you to do your own research. I want you to look at this yourself. But here is, is what it says. Exactly how many facts does it take to remove the description of conspiracy? We should study and test the facts so we will not be deceived about what the devil is controlling. At the end of the day, it's all about being able to recognize the beast power and avoiding its deceptions. The Lord sends us facts for this discernment. I have to tell you, reading that, I, I, I don't know how to respond almost to it. And I fear that so many have, have bought into this mindset, which I believe is not correct, it's all about being able to recognize the beast power and avoiding its deceptions. I don't think that that is what we are called to do as Christians who are in the checkout lane of this world's history. We're going to talk about, about that a little bit more right after this break. When I was about 15, I had a challenge from Elliot Coleman to develop a machine for harvesting baby lettuce. And so I started working on that and spent about three years and with the help of an engineer got a product that worked really well. And so in the fall of 2012 when I was 18 we started production and started selling this through Johnny Selected Seeds in Maine. They had estimated that we would sell maybe 150 units a year. About two years in Johnny's contacted me and said, we're gonna to have to discontinue selling the product. And this was just a blow to me. I remember sitting in my truck just kind of crying because I felt like, you know, not only was it, we were having financial problems, but now our one and only customer dropped the product. And so I felt like we, we failed. We're, the business is gonna close and it's just gonna be another statistic. And so from there, the business just took off because we all of a sudden had, we were selling directly to the customers and we had full retail price that we were earning on each product. And we were able to develop a website and start selling direct. And then Johnny's was sending all the customers that they had um, marketed to to us because they were no longer selling it. And it was just amazing to see how the Lord took what I thought was a failure and turned it into a huge success. So a few things that we've done are we ship out thousands of packages every year. And so we put glow tracks in all of our boxes with every order that goes out. Amazingly, we had a lot of people contact us and say how much they appreciated it. The other thing that we do is since we're in retail, we close our website on Sabbath. So from Friday night, actually 30 minutes before sunset, sunset all the way till 30 minutes after sunset on Saturday night, our website is closed. And obviously lots of people come to the website during that time, but it says very clear on the page that you come to that the website is closed for religious, because of our religious beliefs. And if they want to click and go and read more, they can. One thing that really affected my view of stewardship and finances was when I was 18, I read the compilation Councils on Stewardship. And that was a big blessing to me because it showed 
the, the dangers of financial success, but it also showed that God created the system of benevolence for our blessing. So if we are willing to be used as channel of blessing to those around us and to the world, God will pour blessings onto our lives and that channel will just grow and grow and grow. We also made the decision to tithe our business profits. And I can say that I feel like the Lord has blessed that decision tremendously. You know, it's kind of like the example of a, a pond. You know, if a pond doesn't have an outlet, it just becomes kind of a stagnant, nasty, stinky pool. But if there's water flowing out and there's water flowing in, it stays very fresh and it will stay full. It's the same with stewardship and the same with finances. If we just hoard our money, God cannot bless and it just kind of, it, it turns out to be a huge um, harm to us. But if we use it as a channel, God will resupply as we give. And then it's a huge blessing to us because as human beings, there's nothing that, that blesses us more than, than being a blessing to others. I am a steward because God is my faithful guide. Troublesome times, Troublesome times are here, filling men's, filling hearts, men's hearts with fear. Freedom we, Freedom all, we all hold dear, now is it freedoms stay. now at stake. Humbling your hearts, Humbling your hearts to God, God. saves from the saves chasing, from the chasing rod. rod. Seek the way, Seek the way pilgrims the trod, Christians awake. Jesus is, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night, morning or, night or noon. Many will, meet Many will meet their doom. doom. Trumpets, will sound. Trumpets will surely sound. And all of the dead, of the dead shall, shall rise. Righteous meet, righteous meet in the, in the skies. Going where, no going where no one dies. Heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be o'er. Happy forevermore. When we meet on that shore. Free from all, care. Free from all worldly care. Rising up in, in the sky. Telling this world goodbye, goodbye. Homeward we then, then we'll fly Glory to share Jesus is, Jesus coming, is coming soon Morning or, morning night, or night, night or noon Many will many meet, will their, meet their, doom. their doom Trumpets will sound, Trumpets will surely sound. All of the dead All of the shall, shall rise Righteous meet, righteous in, meet the in the sky skies. Going where no Going where one, one, one dies Heavenward bound My Jesus is Jesus coming is coming soon Morning or night, morning or night or Dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Welcome back. I'd like to show you a picture on the screen really quick here. Um, this is actually a screenshot I took from my own Facebook page, my own Facebook wall. And uh, last week I saw this posted on Facebook and I thought, man, this is amazing. Think about this. Uh, there's going to be this, uh, this, this uh, thing in the, in the heavens, in the, in the st night sky, which is going to be like a smiley face. And, oh, we just need some positive news. And I saw that and was like, wow, that's so cool. Share. And a lot of people liked it. You can see actually some numbers there on the bottom of how many people liked it or loved it or shared it. The only thing is, is that within a few hours, another Facebook friend of mine says, um, by the way, that's actually false. 
That's not true. And then I did some more research on it and discovered somebody else in a, on a different website had looked it up and, and they had a, a star chart and they had gone forward to that date and it's true. It's not real. Boy, I tell you what, I felt embarrassed by that um, because I usually try to be very careful about what I post to make sure that, that, it, that, that it really is true. And um, my emotions got the better of me and I shared it. And I uh, just, I felt bad. You know, we have to realize this. Many people who get very caught up in conspiracy theories, they do it for a legitimate reason. And that is because we want to have some understanding of what is happening in this world, in this chaos. We try to make sense of it. And when, when what we see on the surface just doesn't seem to make sense, Often we are led to, well, there must be some hidden agenda or hidden meaning or something behind the scenes. And, and so people are led to that. It's legitimate. And, and we can understand that. And especially now in times of stress like we're dealing with right now with the impact of COVID-19, there is that tendency. There has to be some motive, some reasoning behind it. As from what my reading of the Bible, here's the reason. Because the world is a sinful place. And when in a sinful world, bad things happen. There's diseases, there's viruses that happen, things go wrong. We are on a broken planet. But that's not the end of the story. That's the good news. Jesus is going to come and he's going to make it all right again. You know, I felt so bad about, about posting that and sharing that because I usually do research before, before posting links to articles because I don't want to continue falsehoods. This time I failed. And I owned it publicly on my Facebook wall, and I actually reached out to those who shared it on theirs as well, and I apologized to them, and I said, I'm sorry, this is error. Um, I, I feel really bad about this, but please don't share it with anybody else. And, and some of them had to put you know, you know, corrections as well. I have to say that one person was a little bit upset at me, and they, they responded back, prove it. Send me links to show that this isn't true. At that point, actually, I decided, you know what? I'm not going to take my time to do that. You can do your own research, but if you decide that you want to continue spreading something that's false, knowingly, that is up to you. You know, the danger of, of ministries and individuals who are looking for all the errors in the world or all the errors in the church and, and the hidden stuff, and they're trying to just root out all the stuff that's bad, they're trying to find the sinister meanings and the motives, the secret signs and the symbols. Here's the thing. By beholding, we become changed. The more we try to find the error, the falsehood, the more we pay attention to that, the more we are actually changed into the very thing that we are trying to find the danger in. Now, while it is prudent, and it is prudent for us today to be aware of the events that are happening in this world. We are not to be so caught up in it that we are distracted from our first and most important thing. And that's in, the, in a verse I shared earlier. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That has to be our number one, our main priority, not just of what we seek, but also what we share. Whatever you share online, whatever you tell somebody else, it should be first and foremost all about the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all about the goodness of Jesus, all about the love of the Father, all about the grace that he poured out on us, all about the reality of this great controversy that we are living in, which ends with the glorious return of Jesus Christ and God's love just being poured out on his people. That is what we need to be sharing more than anything else. The other stuff is just a distraction in the checkout lane of history. It's tabloid Christianity, and it's not what God would have us to share. You know, I think the Apostle Paul had the correct fo focus when he said this in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, as we are in this checkout lane of history, don't be distracted by the tabloid-style messages that the, that the devil is bombarding us with constantly. 
And by the way, I do believe that those, that tabloid style um, distractions are going to be more and more right before the return of Jesus Christ because the devil is trying to get our focus off of Jesus Christ and his righteousness any way he can. And he will even use ministries to do that. If we are too much focused on the beast power or on this over here or on what that person is saying behind the scenes, our focus isn't on Jesus Christ. And that's where it has to be. As we are here in this checkout lane of history, all those messages, you know, those who are caught up in conspiracy theories, the one thing I've discovered in talking with them, they can never get enough. Every time you consume more, it makes you want more. It's like an addiction that continues to build on itself. You got to have more. You got to find out more danger, more evil, more, more wickedness. Find out what other hidden things there are. You know, Satan used that at the very beginning of the Garden of Eden. He started this whole thing of conspiracy theories when he said to Eve and he said to Adam, oh, has God really said that? Let me tell you the real meaning. Let me tell you the hidden stuff behind the scenes. Let me show you what God is trying to hide from you. Satan himself was the author of conspiracy theories. Let us not be people who continue on that work that he began even in the courts of heaven causing a third of the angels, to follow him in rebellion. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ, the author, the finisher of your faith. The the price of taking your eyes off of Jesus at all those tabloid distractions, paying attention to all that, the price for that is just too high. I'd like to leave you with some verses from Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3. And again, it's talking about this process of buying that which is good. And in this, it says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money, without price, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat that which is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make you with an everlasting covenant my steadfast, sure love for David. That is a message for us today. Everything we need, we buy, and yet it says that it's free. And what is the most important thing to have in your shopping cart as we are in the checkout lane of this world's history? It is the grace of Jesus Christ. It is the free gift of salvation. You can go through your entire life, and if that's the only thing you put in there, and everything that comes with it, that's enough. Focus on that. Share that. Talk about that. Praise God for that. Don't get distracted by all the other tabloid Christianity that's out there. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ and him alone. Please pray with me. Father, thank you so very much that you sent Jesus here the way, the truth, and the life. And that through him, we have access to you by grace, through faith, not of ourselves, but as a free gift that we have been given. Lord, help us not be distracted by all of the things that the devil seems to bombard us with that gets us to take our focus off of you, off of Jesus, and to begin to be so fearful of the world around us. Lord, help us to, be, to have holy boldness, to stand up, to say, no, I will trust in Jesus Christ alone not in all those things of understanding hidden meanings. The only meaning we need to understand is that God loves us enough that he sent his only begotten son for us, that we have eternal life because of it. We pray this in his name. Amen.